seeing folks that are jumping into the webinar right now uh, to our Zoom meeting. So I'll just give it a second while folks are joining. Thank you all for coming uh, tonight and joining us tonight. Okay, looks like everyone has jumped in. Um, it's great to be with you all uh, tonight. Welcome, thank you so much for joining us. My name is Ryan Hampton. I'm the founder uh, of The Voices Project. Uh, welcome to our virtual town hall, Addiction and Mental Health Recovery, as we begin to come out of COVID. Uh, I'm grateful to see so many people, uh, colleagues, friends, uh, individuals impacted by addiction, people in recovery, providers uh, joining this, us this evening. Uh, thank you, thank you for submitting your questions. Um, before we get started uh, tonight, first I, I do wanna thank and welcome uh, our participants. Uh, former Congressman Patrick Kennedy, founder of the Kennedy Forum, uh, Suzanne Kunis, uh, Vice President of Behavioral Health of Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, Nick Boatman, uh, Chair of the Board of the Discovery, Nonprofit Discovery Institute, and Chris Thrasher uh, of the Clinton Foundation. You know, I think it is important as we, we kick this off this evening that it goes without saying that the work uh, that we're all doing uh, together has never been more important. You know, just this morning, the CDC released its updated provisional overdose data uh, for the 12 months ending in September 2020, which is pretty much right in the heat of the COVID-19 pandemic and lockdowns. And these numbers are certainly a grim picture of the work that we have ahead of us. They show that 90,237 predicted overdose deaths in that 12 month period. That is a 28.8% increase from the year prior. Again, this is another historic high in overdose fatalities. And sadly, I think that we will continue to see numbers like this as the, as the CDC updates them uh, in the coming months. So as we continue down the road towards recovery from uh, COVID as vaccines are becoming more widely available in communities all across America. And as state and local economies began to reopen and resume business and operations, I believe that it's incumbent on all of us to do all that we can do to tackle this overdose and mental health crisis head on. So again, thank you all for being here tonight, taking time out of your schedule to join us for this important conversation. Many of you have already sent in questions and we're gonna to try to get as many, get through as many as possible. Uh, I'll be serving as your moderator this evening. Uh, you can also feel free to send in additional questions using the Q&A feature on Zoom. You'll see it at the bottom of your screen. Uh, feel free to send those in and those will come uh, right to me. So to kick off this evening, I thought it would make sense and, and would be appropriate if we went around the panel and each panelist had an opportunity to share kind of a, a personal challenge that they've learned uh, coming out of the COVID pandemic that has you know, furthered their drive, furthered their, their passion for the advocacy that they do in the addiction and mental health care space. And I think that uh, tonight, uh, because he's one of our, our guests of honor, we'll start with former Congressman Kennedy. Well, thank you very much, Ryan. It's great to be with all of my uh, colleagues and Chris with you virtually, uh, such a fellow soldier um, in this uh, movement. I just want to tell you, uh, Ryan, you have been the best. I mean, this initiative, the Voices Project, going out like we did today to sober housing here in this community where we're at in New Jersey, uh, distributing naloxone and not only distributing it, but giving people the how-tos in terms of using it, the ABCs. Um, uh, first, A, administer, don't wait. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you're wondering whether that's time or not, tell them you're about to give them an, an naloxone, and if they respond, then it's okay. But mm -hmm. if they don't, then you know it's time. That's pretty simple. Um, B, breathe. This notion that so many people are being lost, and where, as you said, 90,000, that a lot of them could be, have been prevented if not only we administered, but then we helped them with their um, oxygen just by breathing for them. And then C, then make the call. And, and, and A, B, C's, let's keep these things in mind. It was amazing how many people at that recovery center 
They said they'd heard about naloxone, but they're a little sheepish and they weren't sure. They were so glad to get the uh, uh, demonstration. And when we're losing this many people and to the other participants that you got to have there with us, um, Ryan, you had them go through the fact that the, the opioids they brought the two of us into recovery. Um, I just said to myself, I'm so grateful that I got in recovery before the fentanyl started happening. Mm -hmm. Because as we heard from all of these people in the recovery house, uh, it's all fentanyl today. Mm -hmm. And um, that expedites the, the risk factors for people to overdose. Um, it's not your old, you know, your father's mm -hmm. Oldsmobile uh, heroin. I mean, in fact, today you're, it's a tough ch chance to find heroin that isn't laced with the fentanyl. So I just want to thank you so much, Ryan. I think it's so important that people who are, who are following you on this um, webinar understand what you're trying to do in the states to, to get people motivated to take action to stop this now. I mean, to think that these 90,000 people who were just announced today by CDC <clears throat> – we could prevent those deaths. Those are totally preventable deaths. Um, now, can we get them into treatment and then into recovery? But let's at least get them from dying mm -hmm. and that, that they don't even have access to this um, in many of the recovery places where there, there are the most people who would know who in their families or their communities needs that um, protection. And I want to thank the Clinton Foundation <clears throat> for making this a real priority because, uh, he, you know, the president's been terrific in just using his mantle to get uh, pharmaceutical industries to make um, these uh, naloxones more available. So I, I just say on a personal basis, I'm thrilled on the positive side to be able to go and Zoom with my fellows in recovery day or night, 24-7. Never have had that awareness in recovery in all the years that it, I've been, and I'm happy. Uh, Chris is on the phone who gave me my 10-year uh, chip, and I could do that with my fellows all over the country at the same time. I had my old buddies from Rhode Island with me and everybody else. Um, I think that's great. Um, the downside is on my family. Like, I can, my little ones, not a problem, but, you know, my teenager, this amount of time remote away from her classmates in addition to all the time that she had on technology to begin with, not a healthy thing. And so I really worry in advance of the coming waves of people who are prone to addiction that we have a whole new generation that are going to be really vulnerable, you know, because not only the more potent available um, drugs out there, but also because people are more fragile, if you will, because of what's happened to them in the course of uh, the COVID experience. <clears throat> Absolutely. Um, Suzanne. Sure. Hi. Thanks again for inviting me today. I'm, I'm really honored to be here. So I, I truly appreciate it. So for me, um, this has been, so I'm in the middle right now, quite honestly, of planning my nephew's memorial service. Um, we will be doing that over this coming weekend. 35 years old, father of a 10 year old daughter. Mm -hmm. um, he was in a, he was a guy who was an amazing master craftsman. He could build your home without ever having to bring anybody else in. He was just unbelievable. But, um, you know, he struggled for many years with drug and alcohol issues and wound up having a motorcycle accident in South Jersey. And fortunately, if there is such a thing, you know, he had uh, died immediately on impact. But he was high and somebody evidenced the whole thing and he, you could see the whole thing actually get ready to happen. So I watch him and we've tried to help him for years. We were talking about this earlier, you know, you can't, you know, you can lead the horse to water, but you can't make them drink. And I said, this is what I do for a living. And how hard it is to have watched my, you know, this happen to my family. Nobody is immune. And it's just, there's, the stories just are deeper and deeper. And I, and I look out to all, so many other people. I mean, when we have his memorial service, we're having materials with us for, because we know there are a lot of people that will be there that are either currently using or in recovery, and maybe we can help them. I'm trying to think about, can I get some naloxone to take and have it there for, for this? Um, but it's just, like I said, no one's immune, and it is such a huge issue. And I work in an insurance company. I know everybody thinks the insurance company are the big bad folks, but honestly, we have committed ourselves, uh, particularly I've been here for four years, 
to do everything we possibly can to try to change the dynamic out there. And we have embraced, I mean, again, as Patrick said, COVID has brought some horrible things, but COVID's also brought some great silver linings as it relates to mm -hmm. the use of telemedicine and better engagement for kids in treatment and no-show rates that have dropped by 50% because people are doing virtual visits. I mean, there are so many positive things that we just have to hold on to and just keep building on. So, but thank you for, uh, for having me here today. Thank you, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, <clears throat> Nick. Yeah, first off, thank you, Ryan. I'm uh, very grateful to be here. We have some some heavy hitters here and some great people on the panel. And uh, you know, thank you to the Clinton Foundation, you know, for that that donation and, and you guys rounding that up. And also the Kennedy Forum, Patrick. It was an incredible day that we had today. Suzanne, the Voices Project. Um, these are people that are really making a difference in our community. And um, you know, for me. What really, you know, set things off, I mean, it was, it was my immediate circle of people. I mean, this is something that we all struggle with. It's something that I've struggled with, my wife, my family. Um, you know, I've had loved ones, people that I know from in recovery that, uh, that have passed away, you know, over this. And, you know, the one thing that really sticks out to me is I had, I had one of my best friends and also he's an incredible advocate. I mean, this guy has touched so many lives and the ripple effect that he's had in this community, you know, over the past 10 years, he, it was a lot of isolation from COVID. So he, he was isolated. Uh, there was some unfortunate circumstances that, that happened in his life and his mental health spun out of control and it eventually led him to using. And this, this can be any one of us. And uh, that really hit home for me because this is a progressive disease. This gets worse, right? So we have to hit this head on and we have to do something about this. Overdoses are sky high. We saw the numbers come out today, mental health. And um, you know, it's going to be a rough couple of years. And that's why we're all here is to make a difference and come up with some solutions and, and make an impact. Thanks, Nick. And uh, Chris. <clears throat> sure, thanks. And thanks for having me here tonight, Ryan. I uh, bring you greetings on behalf of our 42nd president of the United States. Um, yeah, President Clinton um, has just been a, a real pleasure to work for because of his commitment to these types of issues and making sure that naloxone is accessible, it's available, it's affordable. So it's, it's just so important. Um, you know, when I think about COVID-19 and some of the lessons that I've learned, you know, as a person in long-term recovery like Ryan and like Patrick, you know, I think about how, um, you know, when, when COVID-19 really happened, it forced us um, who are in long-term recovery uh, into isolation, which as we know, you know, doesn't mix well with all of the principles of recovery. And so to be able to pivot and basically bring all 26 million people in this country that are in long-term recovery together in a way that really has never been done before was an amazing feat. And to think of how quickly we were able to do it is also pretty incredible. But early on, one of the things that I very quickly realized is, you know, the novelty of Zoom allowed us to do things that we probably have never done in recovery for many of us, which would be like Zoom into a meeting in the Philippines and then Zoom on over to London for another meeting. And what I sort of got worried about initially was, what about the local support network that we all depended on before COVID? What will happen to those people? Not necessarily the people in my immediate support network, but that secondary circle, the people that we might've only seen in meetings, we didn't have their numbers in our cell phones, but we knew them, we saw them. Where are they? Who are they plugged into? Are they staying connected locally? So, you know, I had to come up with ways of trying to keep my local network together um, and, and using technology to do that is something uh, that I did. But, you know, it, it was not without a challenge. And I think it still is a challenge for all of us to remain isolated, to stay safe, but to be able to stay connected. And I think if anything, the 26 million, as I said, of people, you know, that are living in long-term recovery, you know, we've been brought together in a way that has never really happened before. The question is, can we now sustain that as sort of a, 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 a community? Um, because, you know, together we can do anything and, and surviving the COVID-19 
pandemic in recovery um, has uh, been obviously a huge challenge. The one other thing I would say, um, and I just want to build off of something that Patrick said, is that you know with fentanyl, we're seeing things that um, you know we haven't seen before. The the length of time that it takes for someone to overdose and die is so fast. Um, in fact, I might even say that the C should come first, that we call 911 immediately, and then, you know, we administer and breathe. Because, you know, I, I was just talking to a treatment provider here in Atlanta, the executive director, and she was saying, for the first time ever, they are having clients come in now where their drug of choice is fentanyl. To you and I, that might sound crazy, but remind ourselves what it was like when we were using. I wanted the best. I didn't want anything cut with anything. So it sort of makes sense when you think about it like that. But we know, those of us who are working in recovery, know that this is a game changer. That number, 92,000, is going to keep going up with fentanyl on the scene unless we have people like all the folks out there that know about naloxone, know how to recognize the signs and symptoms of an overdose, and know how to administer it. So. Uh, once again, it's been great to, uh, you know, work with you, Ryan, on this project with Direct Relief. Uh, we are committed, and um, it's because of people like you that we're, we're able to um, save as many lives as we have. So thanks. Thank you, Chris. And I, I also, I, I want to say, you know, th the last Patrick had mentioned the beginning, we were, Patrick and I were out in the car today, and we were out there with Nick and the Discovery Institute, who's our, our New Jersey partner in each state. We had five pilot states, and here in New Jersey, uh, our pilot, our, 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 our partner uh, is Discovery, and we were out in sober homes and distributing this naloxone and getting it out there. And uh, I want to just take a moment, and s I cannot say, and it's not because, you know, of, of of the personal connection, but as a foundation, I cannot say enough about the work that the Clinton Foundation has done um, on behalf of people in recovery uh, and those in or seeking recovery uh, and overdose prevention. You know. Um, not too long ago when when uh, through my own kind of story and, and losing my friend Tyler in a sober home, you know, reaching out to Chris, reaching out um, to to the Clinton Foundation and, and laying this problem out. Um, this is how real partnerships happen. They came up with the solution and they said, we will we will help forge this partnership uh, with direct relief. We will get naloxone donated and we're going to rely on the recovery community uh, to get it out there in the recovery homes. Um, and that's exactly what we're doing. And I, I want to just uh, put a kind of cap on, on this first question and say, you know, this whole trip and, and this distribution the last couple of days, um, it, it was about a month ago for me when, when, when I really realized we needed to be doing more. I mean, I knew we needed to be doing more, but it hit home. Um, I, I lost my last friend to an overdose about a month ago, Mark. And um, when Mark's mom reached out to me, I was convinced it was an overdose, right? I was convinced, I, I knew he had been struggling on and off. But when she got on the phone with me and, and we talked for quite some time, she said, you know, Mark was struggling, but he couldn't, there was nobody to bring him naloxone. There was nobody to teach his roommate how to use it. Um, he lost his job six months prior. You know, he was living in a trailer at the time when he died. Um, he wasn't able to ask, he didn't have, I mean, for us, it's great to have Zoom, but Mark didn't have Zoom, right? Mark was re very reliant on in-person community and connection. And then she laid it on me that Mark didn't die of an overdose. Mark killed himself, mm -hmm. you know, and he committed suicide. And I knew at that moment, we, we got to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and get back out there you know, this community needs us. So I wanna thank all of you for, for coming together tonight and helping to make this happen. So we're gonna take our first question um, from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, comes from Maureen. Uh, Maureen's question is, this is a tough moment for everyone, especially for mental health. It may sound silly, but the phenomena of social anxiety is more real and crippling than ever. How can we best support people reintegrating into the world outside of the home. And I am going to pick on uh, Suzanne first for sure. this one. Sure. Thanks. She's ready. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I, so yesterday I happened to see an article in the New York Times about sharpening up your social skills to get out there again 
after co you know as we start to reintegrate and and it's you know very you know eight simple exercises things to do like go have a meal with somebody blah 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 so there was you know so there's a lot of consciousness about this which is great I worry about the little kids and because you know I have a son who lives in London and they were in significant lockdown still are and he so he went to a park to walk and there was a woman there with her daughter and the daughter was probably two or three and the little girl says oh oh, mommy people and we're thinking this kid is two years old and her, she's terrified to see other people because of uh, you know all everything that you have to go through during the lockdown and everything it is going to be a long road from here and i don't know that anybody has the answer the the you know there's no silver bullet here it's going to take a million people and lots of work to try to do small but steady steps to actually help people to reintegrate and I, like i said i wish there was a magic bullet here but there isn't and i think that's the, the way we're all going to have to do it is just we but we all have to do it together is, and especially for people who are in recovery or who are trying to get into recovery and don't have necessarily those kinds of support systems in place today. And we all need to be there and, and to help them and hold hands and go have those meals together and go and be places in public together and start trying to get people talking again. But that's really kind of where I sit at this point. Can I uh, follow up yes. on that? And. Um, we need to bring mental health into every public school in America. Uh, and absolutely. now with, uh, you know, telehealth, mm -hmm. there's no reason why we couldn't have, uh, if we could get CMS to reimburse for mm -hmm. it. So on site of service, every public school can um, allow their kids in that population to be uh, able to access mental health. That should be a priority for us absolutely. right now. And, you know, the American Recovery Act has money for, quote, going back to school, and so much of it is focused on the numeracy and literacy. Every expert out there I talk to says it's the socialization that is going to be, to your point, to this question's point, going to be the big key for these young people to overcome. And we need more people in those schools to embrace mm -hmm. those kids, not less. And, uh, and we need to embed social emotional learning. I mean, let's just be clear about this. We, when they start their school year, they get their eyes checked, their hearing checked, their scoliosis, they will right. check for meningitis, did they get their vaccinations? What are they leaving out? They're leaving out the most important organ of the body, the brain, and that filters all their ability to mm -hmm. learn. Why aren't we doing, you know, depression, anxiety screenings, yeah. trauma? We know ACEs, adverse childhood experience. This whole experience has been an adverse childhood experience. Exactly. So I think this is a watershed moment. Mm -hmm. I think really we could redevelop our whole education system. If you know about education, it's where the young people are. Right. And where are these illnesses? Where the young people are. And learning how to cope. And of course, you say, I'm a new father. I took, took me till 40 to f figure out I could have a family and be responsible for others. You know, who gives you the handbook? Like, how do you teach this? And if I weren't in recovery, I don't think I'd have as many tools as I have mm -hmm. now. But uh, we all need these tools, coping mechanisms, mm -hmm. you know, how to mediate. It's all cognitive behavioral therapy, mediate our feelings. Um, we learn that in recovery. But we need to make this available in a ubiquitous way to our kids as part of education. Because if they can't learn that, how can they learn anything else that they're being uh, taught? Could I just add, add to that, Patrick? Uh, yeah. Because I also think about the parents. Yeah. Because we're going to have kids in school, and we're going to do all the work with the kids. And, and a couple of things. One, how do we help parents? Because parents don't know how to, to have conversations like they need to with That's their kids. Right. That's number one. The other thing is, what happens as issues are found? We don't, there's the, the scope of, of capability in terms of psychiatry and other behavioral health clinicians. We have to really look at how we expand who that real treatment team is to help people at, so you get them early so they don't turn into patients that have long, and everybody, this is, this is a, chron, you know, a um, chronic disease. And everybody has to buy in and accept that because that is re the reality of the world. But let kids, kids today can talk about things better than they used to with their peers, but parents have to be able to get comfortable with that. That's right. And you talk about screening. I mean, every every annual physical that happens in this country should have a component of, of a mental health screening attached to it. And not just, don't ask me my two PHQ questions. Right. That isn't, that's not even close to being enough. We got a long way to go. But again, 
lots of voices coming out and, and trying to drive this. Well, what I'll just finally say is, Ryan, you're really pushing in all these states for people to become advocates. Mm -hmm. Because right. these are not novel ideas, but we need them to bring them to their state legislatures, yes. to their mayors, to their local county officials, to their governors, and, and so forth, that we need capacity. We need capacity. Mm -hmm. You said there's just not enough people. And, and as you know, Chris, when you said 26 million people in long-term recovery, how do we get them, you know, my uncle, President Kennedy, made the famous qu quote about ask not what your country could do for you, but we could do for your country. We need that call to national service mm -hmm. amongst those of us who have been blessed enough to know that our own survival is contingent upon helping other people survive. Mm -hmm. What a beautiful thing if we could have these recovery cores like you've been working with, Ryan, around yes. the com uh, country. It'd be great if people knew more about those recovery uh, communities and the recovery core. I love the sound of that, and uh, we need it for sure. You know, I want to I want to add into this that you know the principles that we talk about often in recovery are universal, and they can be shared with our kids that are struggling with mental health, you know, challenges at home, being isolated for the last year. You know, it, it reminds me that we kind of the royal we, if you will are all in this together, you know, the principle of unity um, and reminding ourselves kind of on a daily basis that one plus one plus one is far greater than three. And that's so important. I think that, you know, baby steps really is the principle that I would incorporate here much in the same way that, you know, if I had to think that I had to do, you know, anything like all at once, it would be, you know, really overwhelming for me. And, you know, I learned early on in my recovery to break things down into manageable kind of chunks. You know, it's like that African proverb of how do you eat an elephant, right? One, one bite at a time, you know, how do I live my life one day at a time? And the truth is, is that, you know, I can share those principles with my kids. You know, I have watched my kids deteriorate. I have two, a 14 year old and a 17 year old. My 17 year old has been in the hospital twice and in a long-term residential treatment center for depression, anxiety. Um, uh, over this time in COVID and I watched it happen. She was not exhibiting any signs of depression before COVID. So this has all been as a result of, and, and I know that I am not unique. I know that our kids are challenged right now. And so, you know, I've been trying to share as much as I can about some of the principles that I've learned in recovery with, with, with my kids, with my family, because it is so important and it's so practical. You know, I can do this today. I don't know about tomorrow. I don't know about next week, but I can do this today. Um, manageable chunks, so. Absolutely, uh, Nick? Yeah, I think, um, you know, there's a lot of really good points here and we're gonna have a lot of adjustments for people that are going back in the community and that's, you know, anxiety, mental health is a, a very real thing and, and a big thing of that. The opposite of addiction is connection, right? And community. And we need, it, that's why Johan vaccines. Johan Hari, by the way. What's that? Said that, Johan Hari. <laughs> yes, yes. And, you know, that's why vaccines are, are so important right now. I, I think, don't quote me on this, but what states around 25% and we need to continue taking those. I think you said it earlier today, Patrick, that yeah, we have a, a pandemic right now with COVID, but if, if COVID wasn't around, the pandemic would be overdose, mm -hmm. right? Addiction, mm -hmm. what's happening right now? And I completely agree with the screenings. We need, you know, a full comprehensive treatment model. So when people are going for their vaccines, when people are going to their primary care physicians, when people, you know, are going to the ER, they need these mental health and substance use screenings. And, you know, I think peer involvement would be a fantastic thing that we need to do. As I said earlier, this is a progressive disease. It's kind of like, if we don't nip this in the butt now, you know, what happens, it's like somebody that has a toothache, right? If you don't address it right now, well, what's gonna happen down the line? You're gonna have a root canal or you're gonna end up having surgery. So we need to implement the, the screening process. We need to get peers involved. And I think that'll make a huge difference. That's a great run up to our second question uh, coming from Chris in Trenton, New Jersey, here in New Jersey. Um, Chris's question is what touch points can SUD substance use disorder and mental health providers use with respect to COVID vaccine distribution and testing 
that will help curb overdose and suicide rates. I'm going to take a point of personal privilege really quick and throw my opinion in on this. We should be handing naloxone out to every mm. single person. And then mm. I will kick it to Patrick. <laughs> well, I talked enough in the last uh, question to fill up both uh, questions. But uh, yeah, no, I mean, I, I, uh, I really think we missed a, a historic opportunity to uh, fix the original sin of our current healthcare system, which was having mental health be thrown out of the house of mm -hmm. healthcare. And everyone knows that this is such a pandemic, public health, it would have communicated if, if on our national level we had said, you know, you're not gonna get free with just a vaccination, That's right. right? Yep. You're gonna need to get mental health. Everybody's gonna need it. So don't think you're special or, or worry about being stigmatized mm -hmm. or identified because everybody, it's our national priority to say, mm -hmm. just like getting a shot in your arm uh, for your vaccination, we're also gonna do these things to help you prevent because of course we're at a point now where dependency on alcohol and benzodiazepines and everything else that people are starting to use too much of over the COVID, that may not be ad addicts yet, uh, people with addiction, th those things could become addiction, right? That's the mm -hmm. challenge for early intervention now is that we need to make this a national priority for everybody. Um, so that's what I would say. I, you know, I have to say as a, a <coughs> psych hub dot, Org, we've we've managed to put together um, a, a whole list of materials, videos, articles, video, uh, and everything else that really we're distributing at vaccination sites um, for the states that have bought the material. It's it's really just to cover cost, but um, we should have had a more formal like mass unit outside these mass vaccination yeah. sites to, to communicate to people that it's not a one and done. You have to have both. And uh, but the next best thing is we need to get people to know that mental health is mental health and there's no health without mental health. And and COVID's impact ultimately could end up taking more people's lives as we're seeing from these recent CDC numbers from the impact of COVID than from the actual virus itself. And we need to be mindful of that so that our CDC and our HHS and all of our other agencies start to wake up to the fact that they need to be putting more resources towards this or commensurate resources towards this like they've been doing with COVID. Yeah, one of the uh, things, I, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, you know, uh, Patrick, you're touching on stigma also, you mm -hmm. know, we must work together to address stigma. You know that old saying it takes a village this means that communities have to come together in a new and different way i mean think about community the fabric of you know healthcare professionals providers parents teachers uh families public policy makers um researchers you know law enforcement i mean the list goes on and on right it's really the fabric of our community might i even suggest that much of the work that we do it is even um the faith-based community that is often overlooked, you know, and I think it's the glue that holds many of us together in our communities. You know, here's what we know. We know that substance use disorders have complexity and, and it needs a, a cultural shift, if you will. But, you know, we also know very well that this epidemic cuts across all demographics, you know, as one program says, regardless of age, race, sexual identity, creed, religion, lack of religion, these are affecting all of us. And so it's going to require all of us working together. COVID-19 is no different. It requires everyone. So, you know, I always say, know who are your community influencers. Invite them to the table. You know, radical inclusivity is a commitment and it's a principle. You know, I always say, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. Bring them to the table. Everyone has a part to play in this thing. Um, but, but we all have to be you know, uh, willing to come to the table and have the conversation. Stigma and education, you know, education is the number one thing. Uh, and it's the only way that our lawmakers are going to change is if they're educated. Well, I would, I would just add to that. I, I oftentimes say, you know, stigma is like public enemy number one, right? Because when you look at uh, how dollars are being doled out for COVID, like that's how you deal with a true public health emergency, right? You marshal every single resource available to the federal government, available to state governments, available to municipalities, and you deploy it, 
right? But it feels like with substance use disorder, with overdose, with suicide, right? We're nowhere near that right now. And that's because I have a theory, but you know, I'm also very political on this, is they don't see them equal. We talk about them very well in talking points that they're equal, but they're not treated equally. Yeah, uh, Suzanne. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Nick. Go ahead, Suzanne. All, all okay. I was going to say, just two things real quickly. One is I was really disappointed when I saw the list come out of the people who were eligible to get the vaccinations first. And I read down the entire list, and nowhere on there was there anything about people who either had mental health challenges or substance use issues. And I thought, this is, this is it. This is exactly what's wrong here, because we don't view this like a chronic illness, like everything else is. And I think that was horrifying to me. And I kept saying to someone on Patrick's team, what's he doing about it? But he didn't, I didn't get an answer. The, um, <laughs> the, other, the other part of that is on stigma. Uh, stigma, you all have hit it on the head, obviously. But the thing that, to me, is, again, one of those kind of silver linings is when you start looking at some of the data that's out there and some of the, the, the um, surveys that have been done, we're seeing pe excess of 50% of the adult population saying that they are depressed and anxious and, f and in need of help. And that's the first time I've seen numbers like that to make it kind of, to try to normalize this whole thing, to say this is, we all live with this. And this is, this is something that we all need to pay attention to, just like we do the diabetes and the high blood pressure and everything else. But, so thanks, sorry. To... <laughs> no, no, that's fine. I actually really like this question because, um, you know, yes, I'm, uh, you know, we gotta break down the barriers to treatment and to, to mental health, we, we all know that. And yes, I'm the, I'm the chairman of the board at Discovery Institute. I also have a, a treatment center out in the Midwest in Missouri called Sauna Lake Recovery Center. And um, what we did out there with a few other partners and we got a, my team and I, what we worked on, we opened up what's called urgent access centers, okay? So the theory behind this and what we've done, we've seen a couple of them uh, populate over, over the country and, and I encourage everybody to look at this model, is we, we almost took an urgent care model, right? And this is attached to our outpatients and we made easy access. So anybody can walk through those doors and get immediate access to a psychiatrist. We do rapid bube access to Suboxone, we give out Narcan um, and we have crisis interventions there. It's, it's about meeting people where they're at. And, you know, if you look at- like a in minute the, clinic, like a minute clinic. Yeah, but it, you know, mental health. in yeah. Missouri, it's taking people, you know, it can take 60 days, 90 days to get a psychiatric appointment. That's unacceptable with where we're at. So you get those immediate services and we meet people where they're at, mental health, substance use, and then we have crisis interventionists there, right? So maybe they're not ready for treatment today. Maybe they're not ready to take that next step, but next time they come in, okay, are you there? Are you, are you ready to do this today? And um, you know, it's been it's been incredible. I think we've we've helped a lot of people that wouldn't otherwise maybe have gotten the help. And we've distributed a lot of Narcan and a lot of resources. So that's a model that um, I think we should be looking at uh, across the country. Definitely all about no 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 uh, objections to innovation from from this side. I think we need more innovation in the space. So thank you for that. Um, next question is. Uh, our first anonymous question of the evening, but anonymous from Michigan. And that question is, how can we get Medicare, I guess Medicare or Medicaid, uh, to start paying for the full uh, substance use disorder continuum of care? And I know Patrick will like the second part of this question. And what role will parity enforcement play given the demand for addiction and mental health services is expected to be at an all time high because of COVID? But I'm going to mix it up, and I'm actually going to give Suzanne the he, mic. He was perched up. One. He was ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> no, she would have liked what I had to say. Actually. All right, then let him go first. <laughs> okay. No, no, I mean, we are entering a revolutionary period of time where CMS is, is moving fast towards mm -hmm. a value-based contracting, which means instead of giving me the service, get me the outcome. Mm -hmm. And that's what we as consumers should want. Um, you know, they're doing that all across the country. I'm seeing models of this everywhere. And I think that might mean that we spend more on mental health. I don't want just what you might give someone else on, the, which is what I fought for. And the, the law says you give me at least the same. 
We might even want more because we now know the interrelationship between oh, good mental health and good physical health. And we've quantified that. And so total cost to care, if the dollar is on the line, they're going to start spending more on something they've never spent before on, and that is mental health because the returns, if they're, if they're liable for your diabetes cost and your mm -hmm. cardiovascular disease and my asthma and the fact that I've been, I've never had to visit and I'm covered by Horizon. I've never had to be in an ER in the last 10 years of recovery and yet before I got sober, I was regularly in ERs mm -hmm. for contusions and lacerations. I had irritable bowel syndrome. I had back pain. Yep. I was getting, I was a chronic frequent flyer. The, the, and Horizon, they owe a check to my local Trudgers 12-step uh, <laughs> recovery group because that group has <laughs> saved Horizon Blue Cross New Jersey an untold <laughs> amount of money. Um, but it, but that also shows for everybody listening, it's recovery. You, you know, yeah. we got to figure out a way to move those resources to provide that support for people so that they're not just being treated the medical and they get de uh, de released and then they have no support after that, which is why we need to marry both what payers mm -hmm. pay for and what we as who know it's only through helping each other that we get better. Okay, could have stopped about two sentences ago. <laughs> That's but, true. Uh, <laughs> but so, and, and I'm glad you brought it up, so I should give you $5. Because, and you know this, here in New Jersey, what we've done is we're, one of the greatest challenges we have, there's like a laundry list of challenges for mental health and substance use in this country, much less in this state. And one of those pieces is the fact that people that need help go, let's say you go to a rehab and you're being discharged and tomorrow you're supposed to show up for an intensive outpatient program. And if you don't show up tomorrow, no one's going looking for you. And that's one of the, just one of the many, many, many links along the, uh, on this chain that have never been connected or not being connected. What we've done is we actually started a pilot project here in Monmouth County, actually. And it's with, when we start looking at individuals with substance use disorders or even with serious mental illness, they're not going to get primarily treated in a primary care practices office. That's not where most people feel comfortable. But where we saw the great, a huge value is in community mental health. And when we started working with, you know, the CCBHC model is phenomenal as far as I'm concerned and so many others in terms of the scope of services and the availability of services. And what we did is we contracted with a provider here in, in Monmouth County, CPC Behavioral Health. I'll give them a plug. They're amazing. And what, they, what we've done is saying, look, we're going to give you money and your job is for anybody who we can identify through data or gets referred into you. We want you guys to actually embrace those patients, navigate those patients, get them addressed from not just their behavioral health perspective, but what are their physical health issues? What's, what are their social determinant issues? Do they have a roof over their head? Because if nobody has a roof over their head or a bed to sleep in at night, none of this is going to work. Mm, that's right. And so yeah. what we did is we, uh, we paid them to do nothing more than embrace these people, follow these people, go to appointments with them, be feet on the street to them, available 24 seven. And we did this for a year and 500 people went through the program in the year. And, and we, again, are huge believers, but anybody wants to believe, but it's the fact that if you invest in behavioral health services, you will win in total medical expense. And from, and within my organization, I basically said, look, our goal is yes, we'll see total medical expense reductions because the nice thing is it'll translate into premium reductions for people. But even if we save one penny or no pennies, but we don't lose money, we've done right the right thing for people. And so this program that's been up for you know for a year has actually had tremendous outcomes. Patient self-report, which to me is huge because that's where hope is. When people feel good about what's happening and they see fewer emergency rooms or admissions or I haven't had a drink in 30 days or 60 days or 90 days, they feel good. It's really an indicator of what the future is gonna look like for them. And so we had such success in this first, the first pilot that we are now expanding this around the state. And so by the end of this year, beginning of next year, all 21 counties in New Jersey will have this model up and running. In addition to that, we've been out talking to people around the country. And everybody we talk to is interested in doing something similar to it. And there are a lot of different models out there. But we thought the population we're dealing with right off the bat is commercial right now because Medicaid in New Jersey is handled differently than it is in other places, which is fine. And we, we want to show the state, look, this really works. Let's do it together. But there, it's really addressing a whole person, not just 
a piece of a person. It's every addressing everything from front to back and really making sure that they can get to treatment. They have a ride. They've got a house. They've got or some place to live and people to care about them. So anyway. So let me That's say, a, you know, he, there's and, that quote, you know, see the see the light and feel the heat. We need both. So to the point on the parity, you know, there's some major payers who are still disregarding um, medical management practices that are based upon, you know, evidence-based, um, you know, uh, science approach to diagnoses. So those standards have not been met, and, and that's where parity can really be helpful. And parity can be helpful on the in-network st stuff. We really want to make sure people have adequate you know, time to get that access like they would their diabetes mm -hmm. care. And so, but I think that, that there is a, a confluence of both positive for the payers to go in the direction, but we can't let up also on the, on the regulatory side because it's part of the protecting the, the public health. Yeah. I wanted, I, to add, I wanted to add there that, you know, parity is the law and, and mm -hmm. addiction equity, right? And, and in large part, we have Patrick to thank for that. Um, but I want to touch on something, Suzanne, that you said, which you really talked about the public health approach. Um, and, you know, I think all too often in public health, the debate centers around harm elimination versus harm reduction. And you can look at any of the public health challenges, you know, HIV, AIDS, uh, needle exchange, uh, sexual health, obesity, you know, whatever the public health challenges, whenever there seems to be in public health um, this this idea of an implied choice like it's a choice you know stigma is front and center and so you know we see this currently right now in COVID-19 with the weaponizing of a simple piece of cloth over your face to protect your brother and sisters from contracting you know we know this stuff we've known it for hundreds of years um, you know but whether we're talking about individual stigma you know, which, which, which keeps the people who are experiencing a problem from acknowledging the problem and, and, and seeking the help that, that they need. There's family, there's community societal stigma, though, you know, that type of stigma keeps people from recommending the help or acknowledging the problem for, you know, family and friends. Or, you know, all too often, I think it's, it's in the policy arena, right? Where stigma keeps government and the private sector from addressing the problem as a whole. So I think, you know, I hate to be like, a, 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 you know, repetitive, but, but I think we have to attack stigma from all angles, you know, whether it's upstream at the governmental level, you know, whether it's midstream at the community uh, or, or downstream at the individual level, stigma must be addressed. And, and, and I think that, you know, Patrick, with the law, you know, that you helped to shape with mental health parity and addiction equity, I mean, we have the law on our side. Now we have to hold people accountable to follow the law. And until we advocate for that, now I know this because I know the law and I still had to advocate for my daughter to get approved for residential treatment. And guess what? Every five or six days, I had to make another call. I had to be on the phone and tell them why. Why was this important for her to stay in a residential treatment facility? And, and, and I know how to talk to them to get around it. What about all the folks that don't know how to do that? You know, what are, how are we going to help them? So we have to come together. This is what I mean when I say bring a community together. Come together, educate, inform, you know, to, to be able to work with the payers to say, hold them accountable to the law. Because if we don't hold them accountable, I, I can promise you they're not going to pay. They don't want to pay. I, I, I don't want to get in trouble for this, but I will say, and I know some are listening, um, not President Biden himself, but some folks on his team, I think there are some things that the president certainly could do through executive action on parity, and uh, I hope that he does. I think that it's something that needs to be tackled immediately in 2021, uh, not just on the federal level, but also uh, on state level. And I think there's a lot that governors and insurance commissioners can do as well. Um, Nick, you were trying to get a word in. <laughs> yeah, Sorry. to know about. Well, <laughs> I, I really like what Suzanne had to, had to say there. I, I want to learn more about mm -hmm. some of those pilots that you're running. And, you know, what I really took out of that, it, it's all about engagement, right? Mm -hmm. Engagement and long-term engagement. And, you know, going back to the question on how do we get Medicare or Medicaid for, to pay for that full continuum? Well, they're paying for each level of care, but there's two, you know, two hurdles that I see here. One of them is the cert time on what Chris talked about, right? You got to constantly go through the UR process. So it's making sure that people get the time that they need in the appropriate levels of care. But uh, even more importantly, you know, it's housing. 
So what I, I'll speak for New Jersey on what I see on the Medicaid end. You know, if somebody comes into treatment and they're in a rough environment, toxic home life, you know, beaten up, battered, nobody in their pocket, and they go to treatment for 14 days, 30 days, and they have no safe place to go afterwards, what are they doing? They're just going back to that same environment and we're, we're, they're prone for relapse. I mean, we're asking for it and we have to change that. And with the long-term engagement, you add in peers, right? When you have a peer recovery sports specialist that's following somebody from the gate, from the door for at least a year to two, well, then they're calling them every week. How are you doing? Are you following up on your medical appointments? Are you, are you going to outpatient treatment? Um, you know, what else can we help you with? Do you have a job? Can we help you with employment? What are your goals for your treatment plan when they're in the driver's seat making those goals and helping them and supporting them to those goals? But, you know, I think we're shooting ourselves in the foot if we don't look at taking some of these funds and applying it to housing. That's how we're going to get outcomes. If we want this value base, we want outcomes, because outcomes is everything. That's, that's what comes first. We have to give them a safe place, and we have to for this full continuum. Because when they go back to that toxic environment after 14 days, and we want them to go to virtual treatment, you know, it, it's, it's just tough. And, it, and we're not going to see the results that we want to see. And I'll just jump in. To, to, it, it, you always tee up the next question. We have our, our, another <laughs> question, and it's about housing. But um, before I get to it, like, um, look, I always preface this by saying that treatment saved my life medication saved my life i was lucky enough to have access to it um treatment and medicaid actually saved my life because medicaid paid for my treatment but what really has sustained my recovery particularly in the first 18 months something that i had never had before after multiple attempts at treatment was safe stable qualified recovery housing recovery housing was the game changer for me so i can't say enough about housing uh, and building yeah, but this, Ryan, uh, let, let's yeah. tell people what's really going on out there because it's fine to set really great standards, and I, we all want better standards, better quality, but we need access. I mean, right. I don't want to lower standards, but at this time, if we're only saving less than 5% of the population has access to it, but it's good housing, yeah. right. we got yeah. a problem. So, um, you know, we're, we're trying to do a lot of things at once, but we have to be mindful that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, something's better than nothing. And uh, right now, you're getting, the irony is you're going to get nothing if you're all about, oh, it's got to be so licensed here and there and there, and it's going to preclude people from going out and being able to access it. Yeah, we can't, we can't reduce capacity by, you know, throwing up severe barriers for people from opening recovery housing. I think that there's standards, SAMHSA, for anybody that's interested, uh, SAMHSA has really good standards. States can really play a big role uh, in implementing the standards through certification process. And actually, you know, it's, it's kind of our hope in the advocacy community that some of this uh, American Rescue Plan money, you know, can be used to help the states kind of set up an infrastructure to follow best practices and standards. Um, but we can't, you know, certain states have implemented pretty harsh licensing up front, and it has kind of diminished capacity very quickly. Um, and we have to be mindful of that. Well, speaking of capacity, I just want to thank you, Ryan, for all you're doing on the uh, major opioid settlement uh, issues trying to get those dollars to go to support recovery organizations and uh, recovery communities or even to build an infrastructure of sober housing. Can you imagine what a game changer if you were able to make that investment um, that that's really would be a positive down payment on addressing this crisis and I know how much you've been beating up uh, on the um, on uh, Purdue and others uh, regarding trying to get them to put some money aside for infrastructure like s sober housing, which is so yep. crucial to this whole challenge. Which I, and, and I'll, and I, I mean, I could go on forever the, for the, for on this point, but it's one of the reasons, you know, one of the outcomes, the work we do at the Voices Project, and we try to encourage folks at Discovery and have done a lot of great work with Clinton Foundation and, uh, and there's a lot of national organizations, you know, we had a recovery appointments project this year uh, when, when, when President Biden won to try and get recovery people appointed into a uh, uh, High, higher level offices recovery people in recovery people with lived experience 
need to be at the table for these decisions, mm -hmm. right? Because if they're not that lived, that there, there is zero substitute for that lived experience, right? Like I, no disrespect to the folks with the alphabet soup next to their name, but it's not either or, it's both. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, historically we have not seen that. I mean, and Patrick, you're kind of an exception to the rule because you, you have a little bit of alphabet soup in terms of like former member of Congress next to your name. But we need folks who are running recovery community organizations, you know, uh, folks who, who are involved in treatment and prevention and harm reduction and family services. Like they should be sitting on boards and commissions and opioid abatement, you know, commissions because they have a different perspective. Uh, and usually their ear is closer to the ground of what's happening in their own community. Well, um, Ryan, Ryan can, I, can I say something here about the absolutely. housing issue? Because, mm -hmm. you know, it, it really comes back to something that we hear very often, which is, you know, that whole idea of changing the mindset that addiction is not a moral failing, right? But a treatable disease, I think, is and remains key to fighting and beating this thing. But I think that we have to, rec you know, we have to remind ourselves and recognize that the brain is just another organ in our body. And just the way that things can go wrong with the heart, the lungs, the liver, the kidneys, things can go wrong with our brain. You know, and I think we have to be able to talk about that in a non-stigmatizing way. And, you know, housing, I mean, it's education, employment, housing, and human connection. I always say those are the four things that, you know, recovery is all about. And in public health, we often talk about the social determinants of health, which is, you know, where we're born, where we live, where we grow, where we play, where we work. Um, you know, that affects how we experience health and housing is a huge part of recovery and part of the continuum of care model that you know reinforces promotion prevention treatment and recovery and you know i just think that it's all imperative but it's all about leadership and i think that you know if there's anything that i could say tonight to the people watching is you know you are leaders you know because leadership responds to opportunities it responds to challenges to crises and, and leadership is not position dependent. So we need leaders. We need people to be advocates. 26 million strong we are if we work together. And I have a whole <clears throat> bunch of more questions coming in, but we are running out of time. Um, I want to give each panelist just a, a quick, you know, one minute. Uh, if you have a closing message for everyone who's watching here, uh, on the Zoom, also anybody on the Zoom, you can know that this this is also being broadcast on Facebook. If you want to share it with family members or colleagues, you can find it uh, on the Kennedy Forum Facebook page, uh, Patrick's Facebook page, also the Discovery Institute. Uh, it's being broadcast across all three pages. Uh, and just for a closing thought um, for our audience tonight, um, I will we'll, we'll kick it off with you, Chris. Uh, well, I just kind of said it. I'm just going to say leadership is too important to leave its emergence to chance alone. We have to create the next generation of leaders. Great. Thank you. And uh, Nick. Well, I'm just grateful. I'm grateful to uh, be here. I'm grateful for, you know, everybody on here uh, being leaders, everybody at home. I, I agree with you, Chris. Everybody's got to do their part. We're in this together. And, uh, you know, we're seeing the ripple effects right now from COVID. This was a long way before COVID happened, but it's making it so much worse. And I just, we need calls to action on these. We, we have to, or, you know, we see it every day through our treatment centers. These, there's, there is a stigma with addiction, but these are mothers, these are fathers, these are our teachers of our children. These are our healthcare workers. This is our community. And if we don't do something about this, implement screenings, engagement, long-term care, change our model, change our way of thinking, then we're not adapting. We're not moving forward. And this is a new time. We're in the middle of, you know, this is unprecedented times right now. And even though there's been a lot of negative with COVID, there's also been a lot of good. And it's given us the opportunity to, to see things for what they are and adapt and change. And Chris said it earlier, we have to pivot. So thank you. I'm grateful for everybody. Thank you, Suzanne. Sure, thanks. I just wanna say, unless you're living under a rock, every person that's on this call, every person out there is in fact affected by this. Your family members, your friends, your work colleagues, it's, it's there's no denying it. Why, you know, we'll get together for so many other reasons. Why can't we get in ahead of this thing? It is, this, the forces are out there that can really make a difference and it's gonna take the village, right? Every single person 
all of us from all different walks of life and different industries, et cetera, together to try to make a difference here. Because if we don't, I can't even imagine what this is going to be like for our kids or, or their kids going forward. Mm -hmm. So now we have to do it now. Yeah. And, and thank you, Susan, because I think that the CCB Certified Community Behavioral Health Center model is a fa fantastic holistic approach to treating <clears throat> the whole person. And it's great to see you as a private payer uh, bring it out to every county uh, and as a model for the country. It just shows that each of us has an opportunity in our own lives to make a difference. I was blessed. I had a famous last name. I could use it to try to do what I could. We all are doing. You're taking your recovery. You're leading it and passing it forward. And Chris and, and Ryan, you, you guys the same. This, I think politics, and I mean both Democrat and Republican, we need to get people more engaged in the politics so that we now have more um, curated issues for everything from housing and education and health care and criminal justice and prevention, con continuity of care and everything. We've got it all mapped out now, but now we need foot soldiers to go to the state houses, to go to the Capitol, to go to the, these public hearings and make the case because you now have a, a, an agenda. The agenda is more detailed now than it's ever been before, and there's more on the line, as everyone has said. So please step up. Um, we have a huge opportunity to take this tragedy of COVID and turn it into a watershed for mental health for the future. This will be the pivot. If we don't take this opportunity now, we're going to forsake a lot of lives in the process. So thank you all for tuning in tonight, and keep plugged in. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, thank you, Chris. Um, thank you to, to your respective organizations uh, for the work you're doing. And to everybody who's tuned in and watching on Facebook, thank you all for what you're doing. You know, uh, you're all partners uh, with us in many different ways. And hopefully, you know, sooner rather than later, as vaccines uh, continue to roll out, we will all be able to be together uh, in person soon. So thank you all and feel free to, you know, you can reach Patrick on social media, same thing with uh, Discovery Institute, you know, that follow the Clinton Foundation, our work at the Voices Project. If you're interested in more, interested more uh, in our overdose response initiative uh, for if you're here in New Jersey, feel free to reach out uh, to Discovery to become a partner. If you're in another state uh, and would like to be involved, feel free to reach out to me uh, through the Voices Project at VoicesRiseUp.org. Thank you all very much. Please stay safe uh, and healthy out there, and we'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.